But for example, the refrigerator that uh, I use at home and so on, and there is an existing energy labeling scheme for this uh, electronic goods. And um, isn't it uh, better to and easier to, or to have um, easy gains uh, either for the climate change issue uh, or for the consumer on his energy saving bill uh, when we support these existing schemes to, for example, to promote uh, the, the, the sales on energy efficient uh, electronic goods and not uh, to, yeah, to uh, work very hard on a new label that in my opinion is not really useful uh, to really change behavior. Um, well, I rather like the um, sort of A to G um, red to green type labels that, um, that uh, have um, uh, appear on electronic goods and certainly from uh, my part of DEFRA and indeed the UK government, we've also been encouraging their use in other areas such as, uh, so uh, unusually maybe, we were able to be a bit faster than, than Europe asked the UK to be on, on cars and of course it's also a feature on, uh, that's related to um, some of the work on housing housing and buildings. So I actually quite like the, the simple, uh, the simple labels on the large things. So there is a question about how fast they move, which is enough that you know the future labels are actually starting to move out. Don't tip they need to move a bit faster. But that's a how do you get things uh, done in, in European bureaucracies uh, issues. So so that those are good types of issues, uh, a good type of label. Um, whether we need, whether we want another uh, another label, an overarching carbon label, I mean I think we just don't know. I, I Personally, I'm not tremendously attracted to it, but I think it's right to do it, do some experiments and, uh, and, and test the utility of that sort of thing as it is being done at the moment. Yeah, I, mean, I think that the point worth making is, is is the point about the relative importance of, of different things, um, and I, I'm a real advocate of starting where it's easiest to have biggest impact, and. In, in the average consumer terms, that is heating, lighting of the home and travel. Those should be the places you start. Um, but actually, 50% or, or more than 50% of the footprint of the average person is the embodied carbon in the things that they buy. Um, and so from that perspective, it is almost the elephant in the room. And we really need to look at how we, we target that. Um, and the first step that, that we've taken is to go and think about the, the footprint um, across the supply chain in delivering those products. Um, quite whether we end up with a label on every single consumer product or some other mechanism, I, I really couldn't say. Um, but it's certainly an area we need to look at because it does represent more than, more than half of the emissions of the average person. Can I just add one more thing to that? Because I think there are other interesting labels around, sort of, or standards and things that have been, uh, um, things like Marine Stewardship Council, Forest Stewardship Council labels. And there are also general, um, general um, labels on environmental quality of foodstuffs. Now we may not move towards something that um, that looks like a sort of energy using appliance label, sort of A to G label. But actually, if we can, one of the things we do need to keep in mind is how we build, as you had said, the understanding of what the impacts are and what the embedded emissions are in these sectors, which are perhaps more difficult sectors like food, which don't are, they're not like cars, they're not like consumer appliances. How you build that knowledge of, um, of uh, embedded emissions into the sort of labels and standards that we use in those areas, I mean, that could be a very significant gain. Uh, what's
In fact, most of us work in companies that have supply based and customer based, which is global. So I wondered if you could perhaps give us a little bit of a, a summary of what work might be going on in the rest of the world, but sort of analogous to how the carbon trust have been talking about. Uh, is it parallel? Are there two competencies, two standards, or so on and so forth? It's actually really important point. I wouldn't mind starting off by all. The climate groups recently done a very sort of rapidly envelope calculation and worked out that about a quarter of China's emissions are exported to, to Europe and the US. So it's an absolutely crucial issue that we need to look at. And I think it's also part of the point which many organisations looking at this are reaching down into their supply chain and talking about capacity building and actually kind of helping out with the obvious things, um, you know, particularly when you talk about manufacturing products. I think it gets a bit more complex when you talk about food. But certainly when you're talking about a manufacturing situation, it is something I think is really important. But uh, I'll just make, make my point first there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Emily just stole my point. Um, yeah, the, the, the work that we did last year showed that the UK is a net importer of products and services, and consequently the UK is a net importer of carbon dioxide embodied in those products and services as well. So, you know, to Emily's point, um, looking beyond the UK boundaries is really important. Um, I think without fail, every single project that we've done working with a, a real product, UK purchased product, part of the supply chain has, has taken us overseas. Um, you know, be that with the, the, the um, fruit being grown from the innocent smoothie through to the, the paper being um, you know, forested and, and harvested for the, for the newspaper. Um, supply chains are international and you need to look internationally. Equally, many of the companies we're working with are European or global companies and are manufacturing for, for different European markets in perhaps even the same factory. So it's very important that um, we take that broader international view such that they aren't um, then beholden to different schemes operating in different countries. Um, and you know, as an example, I, I was out talking to, um, to, to Metro and, and some, some other German companies and, and organizations a few weeks ago about how, uh, how um, things are evolving there. Um, it's fair to say there's a huge amount of work being done and being done in other parts of the world. Um, you know, life cycle assessment, which is that you know, the academic tool to measure the, the supply chain emissions of products has been around for a while. Um, and there's, there's huge bodies of expertise in, um, you know, in, in, in Denmark, in, in the Nordic countries, in, in Germany, Switzerland, and, and, and so on. Um, and it's really important that we, we do reach out and, and work with those, first of all, to avoid recreating the wheel, but second of all, to make sure we get there to market as quickly as we can with something that is, is consistent and, and works for everyone. Um, I don't want to say never, but, but that I'm aware of, no. Um, there, are, there are plenty of organisations um, out making, making claims about their environmental performance and their carbon performance um, around the world. Um, and there are many other organisations thinking about this sort of work, but, but I'm not aware of anyone that, 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 that in scale in, in the market in the way that we can't trust um, in the pilot schemes at the moment. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Michael. I think we'll close there. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Thanks to this panel. I think we're off to a great start this morning. We've had lots of insight. I think particularly Andrew's insight that washing your hair on a lower temperature actually improves its condition. So lots of insight there. Um, we're going to break now for about 25 minutes. I'd just like to mention that we have Dr. Kenny Tang here and he'll be doing a book signing in the exhibition space. He's got a new book out called Cut Carbon, Grow Profits. So thank you very much. We'll see you back here again.